<laughs> welcome, welcome. We are here for our Christmas special, which you can tell it's definitely Christmas because of what's behind me. There's no way I put up these Christmas lights in November to make it look Christmassy uh, just because we decided to record our show early like all the uh, professional people do. Um, huge guest this week. We are delighted to welcome Irish Open champion. He's also GUK PT and WSOP runner up. <laughs> He hasn't won any of them. Sky Poker Ambassador, the great Twitter retweeter of our day, Neil Channing, <laughs> welcome to the show. Oh, gosh. You, you had to get in there with the runner-up business, didn't you? I, I was thinking about that this afternoon, actually, because I was thinking about this. And I thought, you know, I, I expect if we get talking about the World Series at any stage, then and then it just got me thinking about finishing second and stuff. Yeah, it's too depressing. So sad. So sad. Dara, welcome to you as well. Merry Christmas. Thank you, David. Yeah, you uh, you did you did ask me to make some sort of special effort for Christmas. Yeah, and where you are your see, decorations, Dora? I have done none. Yeah, well, I I mentioned this to uh, to my wife that this was the concept for this show, and after <laughs> about a ten minute tirade, what she kept shouting at me, "We don't celebrate Christmas in this house. Christmas is bullshit." <laughs> She did like <laughs> like the great wife she is. She went off. She rooted all over the house trying to find anything vaguely Christmassy. Came back another ten minutes of shouting, saying there's nothing in the house. So uh, I guess I'm cast in the in the role of Christmas. I wish I'd thought of it. I, I I could have popped out for a snowball fight prior to the interview. <laughs> That's it. Well, look, my my, my uh, lights have a mind of their own here. Actually, they're going to put oh, me uh, out of focus at times. I think we've just discovered. Yeah, if you lean back, you actually go out of focus. So <laughs> don't, don't do that. Too much visual stimulus here. Anyway, Neil, the last time I saw you, we were in Malta. It was in the before times, we were. before COVID, <laughs> and you were telling me how you were going to. You're on the cusp of starting two pod, not one, two yeah. podcasts, <laughs> and now you come to us today via, I think, a seven or eight year old <laughs> iPad. Uh, which is propped up against a plant in on, on, on the kitchen table in your sitting room. True. Where, where's all the fancy equipment and where I, the hell are these? Um, yeah, fantastic I podcast. Did, I did, yeah. long enough. We had a lovely, we had a lovely time in Malta, didn't we? I went to Malta. I did a thing that poker players never do: just go to another country and not play any poker. That's very unusual. In fact, I, I think it was the first time I'd done that for uh, quite a number of years, and. Uh, I did. I had been toying with this idea about a couple of different ideas for podcasts. Yeah, because like there's not enough podcasts in the world. <laughs> People definitely need more podcasts. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess because I, you know, I have this thing with Sky Poker. There you go, get that in early. Um, and has they to be, has to be cut now. Sorry. Has to be. <laughs> <laughs> they they said to me ages ago, I, I, quite predictably you know, why aren't you doing this Twitch streaming thing? And uh, I hated that idea. I always hated that idea. Not, not, not that I've got anything against Twitch streaming for people that do it. You know, some people are brilliant at it. Uh, I just felt like it wasn't for me and uh, it wasn't a direction I wanted to go in. But I, I had sort of thought, you know, and I, when you guys started the podcast, I thought that's so much a better idea. And then I didn't do anything about thinking about it. I sort of thought, oh, they're, they're doing a good job of that. I'll let them do that. Actually, but, I, don't uh, know if you, I don't know if yeah. you remember this, Neil. Um, <clears throat> David, you might not remember either, but after our first season, we were looking for a sponsor to, to keep the show going. Oh, yeah. And Neil was actually one of the people we talked to. Neil, Neil was going to try and pitch the idea to Sky and get Sky interested. So in another I did, universe... I did pitch it to them, and I was a firm believer that that was something they should have done. I think they made a mistake, actually. But... Uh, I don't know. I guess they just sort of thought, why do we want to spend a load of money, really? But uh, Murdoch um, and Co could have got a little taste of the GPI <laughs> best podcast ever award. Well, yeah, in see, other worlds, they could see how much goes on production values, you know, the Christmas decorations <laughs> and stuff. But uh, <laughs> this is our entire nice budget. Chat. We went on them. <laughs> Malta is lovely, and I really like it. And we did. We sat down, didn't we, one afternoon, and we, we talked about. Um, I had this idea. I wanted to do a political gambling podcast. I felt like the combination of politics and gambling on politics was something that no one was doing. Um, there has been a little bit of that material out in the run up to the election. Obviously the American election was quite a sort of busy time for content. Um, and I, but I guess now I'd be thinking, well, what the hell do we do with it now? Um, it's a bit of a quiet patch maybe for that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, 
The other one you well, mentioned... It was also it was pre the last general election. I was so gloomy after it. I didn't really feel like <laughs> doing it after that. Well, I was going to say the other podcast idea you had was going to be you and Ralph Little just sort of doing a left wing propaganda thing, wasn't it? I was looking forward well, to it. Well, I mean, that wasn't really my idea. Ralph, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, this is not a name dropping thing, just that uh, I Ralph, dropped it, though. So. You dropped it. So I, I, no, I mean, I'm sure Ralph wouldn't mind me saying he he's doing a really nice podcast now with his old mate from the sitcom that they did together. Uh, but he had an idea to do a podcast and he contacted me. I didn't, I didn't know him at all. We, I, I followed him on Twitter, I think, and he may have followed me back. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. He contacted me and said, um, did I fancy giving him poker lessons? Which was quite a funny thing, really. Um, I sort of wonder why anyone would ask an old dinosaur like me. But I, I did actually, I ended up passing him on to Kevin Williams, um, who gave Why would you do that? Poker lessons. Well, I, I did like because him. I thought they'd, they'd get on quite well. And... Um, uh, yeah, it was funny. We ended, the three of us ended up having a few beers a couple of times. And um, I think Kevin gave him some lessons. But then he got the job in uh, doing the, you know, Death in Paradise thing. And now he's always flying around the world. And his girlfriend lives in New York. So um, we, we don't really, um, we have, and COVID as well. That's kind of stopped us going down the pub. But it, it was funny because he said to me, I would, you know, do you know a good pub or whatever? And uh, I suggested a pub. I didn't know where he lived. And it was literally at the end of his road. Uh, that was a bit weird, given that London's quite a big place. But yeah, he wanted to do a podcast. Um, I don't know. I don't know if people ask me to do podcasts. Presumably they think because I talk a lot. And that's a kind of a benefit if you're doing podcasts. I think you guys, are, you really taught me, particularly that day, about how much discipline and planning it takes. <laughs> that was probably why I haven't done it. I've got notes here. I, I write down copious notes about the guests mm. and, 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 and all the, the, the game tree of where the conversation might go so that we're prepared for any eventuality. And that's amazing. The game <laughs> tree. I like that. I listened to one the other day, actually. I can't remember who it was now. And I remember the guest was, was really quite shocked at how much research you'd done, um, which I've heard them say a few times on your podcast. You do do a lot of deep research. What, do you, what, what facts do you know about me that nobody will know? Well, I, 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 we've had a conversation about this off camera, Neil. You know I'm not supposed to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we got I'm you on. A, I, 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 I'm such an open book. It's impossible for either of you to know anything about me that isn't already out there. <laughs> well, I do want to keep the Christmassy uh, theme going. Uh, yes. I'm the only one properly celebrating. Um, Dara, we've had a lot of Christmas parties over the years. Uh, I guess when we were staking, we used to do an annual firm Christmas gathering of all the lads oh, who wow. staked. Oh, wow, that sounds stake. brilliant, actually. I quite like that. It was really good. I, we used to put a lot of thought and effort into like buying presents. Even if they were in loads of makeup, we still got them okay. gifts. And uh, you know, well, Darren, when you say we, David, you mean you mean you? You used to put incredible effort. I mean, the problem was that like your idea of what a good gift was, and some of our horses was not. Like, you, you used to give them like little pieces of abstract art. So you were you had guys from like the Midlands in Ireland who would never been outside their village and only played poker, and they were looking at this piece going like, "What is this? What what does this do?" <laughs> this isn't even a lie. Yeah, there was a, there's an artist friend of mine and I got him to make bespoke one-off pieces for all these guys. Darren's like, these lads are from Drumlitch. They don't have <laughs> fucking a weird That's little brilliant. glass thing. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> That's lovely. That's lovely. I, I mean, I, I don't think we... I don't actually think we did that with Black Belt. I, we, we probably... We never, we, I don't think we had a big Christmas party. But Christmas time in terms of poker... Whenever I think of Christmas time, I, I, I had a number of years where I would always go just before Christmas to Bellagio uh, for the what used to be called the Five Diamonds. Um, I don't think it's called that anymore, is it? But anyway, probably not happening anymore anyway for a while. But um, uh, yeah, that was always... I, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Vegas between sort of 2000, 2006. Um, and... I mean, like 2005, I, I, I went there. I lived 16 weeks in the Bellagio, so in 2005. That's quite a lot, isn't it? I flew over and back eight times that year. Um, but the, that thing of kind of being in a hotel at Christmas, I, I didn't, I'd come back a few days before actual Christmas Day, but I'd spend like those first three weeks of December there. And uh, I mean, Vegas is a kind of, it's obviously, you know, it's Disney for adults, it's a wacky world. Uh, escape and make-believe and stuff 
But it's even more heightened at Christmas time, don't you think? I always kind of feel like it's a very strange place to go. I don't know, the only thing I can remember when I'm looking back to it is uh, when that tournament sort of ends a few days before Christmas and you're down to the last few tables and everyone just sods off home and there's not much else going on. Um, I remember I was playing one of the sort of dog end uh, thousand tournaments and, and some bloke shouted across the room and some bloke from Manchester shouted across the room to this guy from Liverpool. Uh, are you uh, are you staying any more when you get knocked out of this or are you going back? And he said, no, I've got to be back Thursday because that's me signing on day. Which I, thought was, <laughs> I mean, it was a thousand pound tournament, thousand dollar tournament. <laughs> I did think that was quite good. But uh, no, I did used to, I used to like that. I, the idea that uh, there was a guy who always got us in the Christmassy mood. I used to play in the 1020 game in the Blasio a lot. And there was a guy who was a, like a jewellery salesman. And he was always trying to, between hands, he'd try and sell, you know, stock to uh, the other players uh, on the basis they'd want to give it to their missus for Christmas. And I always thought that was really funny because there were a couple of guys in the Vic that did exactly the same thing. Uh, but I know for a fact that the guys in the Vic had stolen all of their stock. <laughs> um, but like he was referred to, the guy in Vegas was referred to as the jeweller. Whereas the guys in, in London were just referred to as, you know, Frank, you know, the thief, <laughs> basically. Yes. I, I often wondered whether the jeweler was a real jeweler or not. Um, I did actually talk about the, 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 the I mean, I don't, I don't want to bad mouth anybody that's no longer with us, but um, I, I don't think it's particularly bad, but I won't say his name just in case. Uh, so there was one guy that who sadly passed away. He was a great guy. And um, he was like a big Vic regular. And uh, I remember the run up to Christmas one year, he came into the Vic one day and we, we used to play a lot of Omaha in those days, it was probably uh, in the sort of 2000, 2001 or something. There was quite a big Omaha game going on and I was always involved in that. And um, the, the, there was a lady that used to play in the game called Diane. She was, uh, she, she was a kind of uh, sort of late 50s, early 60s, um, you know, quite respectable uh, guardian reader really uh, and you know a bit unusual really to be in this quite aggressive and high stakes Omaha game she was a bit too genteel for that really and uh, this guy came in one day it was just before Christmas and he said uh, oh he said a funny thing happened yesterday he said uh, that Diane she does make me laugh he said uh, it's not been going too well for me and um, you know Christmas is coming up so um, I, I found myself uh, I found myself out in a different part of London to normal, doing a bit of shopping, uh, and I'm walking around the shop, and um, Diane suddenly is there in front of me, and he said it's not an area of London I would ever normally be in. I was quite surprised to see someone I knew, and uh, she said, you know. Oh, sorry, I have to say his name, otherwise it's ridiculous and keeps, I'm not saying. She said, uh, she said, Alan, lovely to see you. How are you? And he was like, oh, no, 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 don't, don't tell you my name or whatever. And uh, she said, what, what are you up to? Doing a bit of late night, late night Christmas shopping? And he said, no, actually, Diane, I'm out doing some shoplifting. Things have not been going too well. <laughs> And she just went, oh, Alan, you're so bohemian. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was a big, like, that was quite a common thing. You'd go into the Vic, uh, you know, around Christmas time, and people would always be offering to sell you stuff, you know, batteries or shaving, you know, razor blades or, um, you know, Somebody told me scented candles is the thing these days. That's the, they're all top class shoplifters uh, because they're not like behind a case or anything like that. They're quite expensive, apparently. Not that I get a lot of scented candles. But uh, yeah, you, it was very unusual to sit in a game in those days without someone trying to sell you something. Um, I don't know. Has that changed in poker, do you think? Not that anyone plays live anymore. Yeah, yeah, not this year. Well, though, you might you might get emailed this year uh, from from some of those regulars uh, asking if you want to 
buy something online. Uh, Dara, I have to ask you, I, I know you very kindly said that I had put a lot of effort into Christmas parties, which I did back in the day. <laughs> but uh, I have to say the best Christmas party we ever did was actually not organised by me at all. And I thought you might let us know about that one and why it was a special one as well, because it was kind of a, a special occasion wrapped into it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, we did most of our staking at the in the first half of the of the decade, and kind of by the middle of the decade, it, it had kind of fizzled out. We weren't really staking anymore, and as a result, I think we thought maybe twenty fourteen would be our last Christmas party because you know the guys were all doing different things and everybody was everywhere. So, uh, Gary Clark, who's one of the great characters of Irish poker, very funny guy really funny guy he he was on to me and he, he he always wanted to sort of like show his face at these parties just come and in, in and say hi he, he described himself as the original friend of the firm so he was asking me about the party and i said oh we're not going to have one this year <laughs> it's not really any point and he was horrified so he uh he took it upon himself to organize the party um, oh that's lovely yeah and it, it was also the year when i had had my big result in vegas when i came second in the wsap so it, he sort of turned it into a celebration he had a he had a banner saying the year of the joke and uh really really nice affair um, oh that sounds beautiful i'm really touched by that already <laughs> yeah um so it was a great night and uh I, uh, I I obviously had a great time because everybody was saying what a great year I'd had. So <laughs> music in my ears. Of course. And uh, we came to the end of the night and um, obviously one of the problems always with these Christmas parties is how do you get home afterwards? Because it's too late to get public transport anymore. <clears throat> Nobody's obviously driving. <clears throat> so you got to get a cab, but you're competing with every every sing single other person in Dublin who's also out at All a All the other party. staking teams are having their Christmas <laughs> parties. Yeah, so I came out of the pub where we were and um, I walked the first cab rank and I just saw there was this enormous queue. So I thought, OK, well, I'll walk to O'Connell Street. There's another cab rank there. Um, maybe that'll be shorter. Obviously, that one was even longer. So I, I sort of walked from rank to rank until I was about a third of the way home. And I decided now, you know, at 33% is the, is the, is the pot commitment point generally. So I, 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 right. I figured I was, I was walk committed now. So I decided, okay, well, there are no more cab ranks, but there's basically my chance of getting in cab or slim anyway. So I'll just keep walking. Now I should point out, I wasn't really dressed for the occasion. Um, maybe our editor would be able to put up a picture, but I was basically just wearing like a normal jacket, no coat, uh, norm, normal uh, suit pants and jacket. So I'm walking through the Phoenix Park in pitch darkness and it's freezing, obviously. <coughs> and uh, it starts to snow. And now my phone is dead, so I can't even try and ring somebody or ring home. Uh, so I'm, I'm walking along in the snow in this uh, fairly flimsy jacket. And I decide this is not good. I'm still a good hour away from home, maybe an hour and a half. Uh, I mean, this is basically a four hour walk we're talking about so, from, from start to finish. So I, um, I, I just decided, okay, I'll take a shortcut. I've the void recently. This is bringing <laughs> a lot of it back. Yeah. I mean, this is the, the, this break was just a break your crawling along the ground. <laughs> yeah, this was, this was one decision or actually like a series a of bad snow, decisions. Like a hole in the, like a kind of a igloo bed thing, you know. So, okay, so I come out of the Phoenix Park and I decide, okay, well, I, I'm going to take a shortcut now. The only shortcut to my house is from the Phoenix Park is along the canal. Uh, so I come off the road and I walk along the canal. The only problem is there's no lights. It's not it's not a place people oh are supposed to walk God. at night. And also no footpath at the time. So I'm literally walking through mud in the snow, in the pitch dark beside a canal, very, very drunk. <laughs> not a, Definitely not a good situation to be in. Um, but I do eventually get home uh at four o'clock in the morning or whatever and uh i'm trying to get in and then my wife opens the door she's obviously rigid with fear she can't understand what's taken me so long she looks <laughs> at me i'm literally covered in mud because i've been walking through the along the mud like a canal um i mean it's to her credit that she just kind of she just kind of shrugged her shoulders and thought well this is pretty normal for him <laughs> there was, i didn't even have to explain what had happened it was obviously something something uh that normally happens to me and happen. But yeah, that was basically the four hour walk home through the snow, drunk from the, from that Christmas party. <laughs> I well, like a nice long walk home in the bad weather though. Like if I if I ever 
uh, you know, had a long session where I felt like I'd really messed up a big pot. This was 20 miles though, Neil. This was 20 miles, this walk. I did. I used to live eight miles away from the Vic for a few years. <laughs> and I, I would walk home, yeah, twice a month probably, especially if it was raining. Like really punish myself. I, I we, Actually, I remember we did used to have Christmas parties in the Vic years ago. Um, they, they, um, they used to kind of do a kind of big Christmas dinner. Um, and there was like sort of four early December sessions where the regulars in the poker room got, you know, a free dinner and everybody got to sit down together with all those people that you hated and that you'd been trying to send them skint for the rest of the year. Suddenly you had <laughs> all this bon me and everything like that. I always found it quite amusing in that respect. But um, I guess probably in about, yeah, about 2001 or something like that, um, it became a real regular thing. I mean, it, I was, what was I then, about 34 or something like that? I was in the kind of top 10 youngest regulars. I mean, that's the way poker was then. So, I mean, there was definitely more than six people that referred to me routinely as kid, even though I was 30, 30 odd, yeah. Um, and I, I would say there was probably eight people that were under 40 that came in more than three times a week to play poker. Um, and we just used to sit down, the, the, the young guys, as it were, and have Christmas dinner together. Um, and then we'd normally, you know, get a bit drunk and uh, sit in a game, but against each other. We'd try and have a, you know, a game just between each other and, and mess around a bit more. Um, yeah, I miss that actually. We, that was a kind of a, definitely a big part of the build up to Christmas. I don't, you're not allowed to talk about Woody Allen anymore, are you? It's all, it's the, he's a kind of, you know, struck off from all polite society. But I was always a big fan of um, the Woody Allen film, uh, Broadway, Danny Rose. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, wow. That, that's, that is literally one of my favorite Woody Allen films. And most people haven't heard film. it. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, but it's I always, a beautiful You know, film, the yeah. Frozen, uh, for people that haven't watched it, he's a theatrical agent and it, a less than successful theatrical agent. <laughs> and um, his clients are, you know, the, the one-armed xylophone player and, you know, various terrible acts. And uh, he gets them round to his house for Thanksgiving. It's actually Thanksgiving, I think, not Christmas. Uh, and they have frozen turkey dinners, you know, that come on a kind of plastic tray. And I sort of, I always used to kind of think there was quite a lot of people that I played poker with regularly, where if we got them together on Christmas Day, that would be what it would look like, that they <laughs> definitely were at home having a tin of cold baked beans. Um, and the fact that, you know, I, I, I did go to the Vic a few times keep, on Christmas keep it, Eve. Keep it light, Neil. Keep it light. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, <Entertainment> show. <laughs> I did used to sometimes go to the Vic on Christmas Eve and, and you know, sort of leave at about 10 o'clock. But uh, I, I definitely sort of thought that was slightly a weird thing to do. And that okay, before Neil really... starts telling the story of all the puppies that have to go in a plastic bag at the end, of... <laughs> I, I, I gotta get back to you, Dara. Did um, you did you guys ever did you guys ever like play poker like literally on the big days though? Like obviously the casino's not open on Christmas Day, but like Christmas Eve or do you do you ever kind of do you play? Well, yeah, on tell, Day that's where I was going actually. Yeah. Dara is Dara's a grinder. Dara does um Christmas Eve as your kind of big night because it's kind of a French thing. Your wife's online, friend. and then yeah. Dara's grinding all Christmas Day. Yeah, I've never played live on Christmas, but I've pretty much every Christmas day I've played online. And it's actually one of the best days to play online because uh, there tend to be overlays. Every other reg in the world <laughs> is taking the day off. And there's a lot of drunk, tilted people who've obviously, <laughs> their Christmas isn't going great, so they fired up. So yeah, it, it is actually one of the, the prize pools tend to be obviously small because the numbers aren't great, but that often means there's overlays and very, very tilted fields. Um, yeah, I mean, I, my wife is French, so actually Christmas is not big for us at all. New Year's is much Yeah, you, you have dinner in the evening on the 24th, yeah. That's that's right, there and that's when go. the presents are given out as well. Um, and then we just kind of ignore Christmas Day, uh, and we wait for New Year's Eve, and that's a, that's a really big deal. Um, but yeah, Christmas Day, I strongly recommend playing if you have nothing else to do. It does when, feel when, a little bit weird, but... Um, when, when I had Black Belt Poker, we used to have like a sort of £10 tournament on Christmas afternoon for people that 
you know, and that was actually, that was a bit, you know, good for people that were a bit lonely and fed up. And we had a community feel to it. And people definitely liked that. We'd get like 30 or 40 people, you know, wanting to hang out together on Christmas Day. I thought it was nice. It was nice. Yeah. No judgment, like, but you do end up with your family for quite a lot of time over Christmas. So it's lovely when you do get to have a sneaky couple of hours with your friends, whether it's by phone or, as you said, like firing up a, a 10 quid sit and go. I hope people uh, don't don't feel too much shame in doing something like that. That's exactly. Really good. If, that, if, if poker's your thing, that's exactly what you should be doing. I even heard uh, Joey Ingram uh, about a month ago talking about how he was doing. I don't think he did it in the end, but a Thanksgiving stream where he just thought, oh, well, my community out there, there might be some people who, you know, don't have family or whatever. Mm. This year in particular with no one that really should be traveling. I know some people did travel, but no one should have been traveling, whether they would, um, uh, you know, be be doing a Thanksgiving kind of on their own or, 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 or with fewer people than normal. And he thought, well, maybe I'll do like a two hour eat your dinner with me <laughs> stream. That's absolutely, I think that's brilliant. I like the Sarah Millican thing that she does at Christmas for people that are sad and on their own. You know, on Twitter, that's a, things like that are really good, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think because of poker being such a kind of predatory thing where you're basically looking to, you know, kill the other person, or not literally, but, you know, kill their bankroll. Um, I always found it kind of funny that we'd all, it was like, it was kind of like the First World War of the trenches and stuff. Like suddenly we'd all football. come out and have this <laughs> Christmas dinner. And then we'd, somebody would say, right, are we going to get a game going? <laughs> like we'd all be, like, you know, patting each other on the back and raising a glass. And then the next minute it was like, all right, I'm going to send you skin. <laughs> um, well, actually, Neil, you mentioned there a moment ago that uh, I guess you being 34 made you one of the youngest in the card room back then. Mm. And poker has changed an awful lot, although I feel like it's both changed and now sort of changing back again in the last few years, it feels like right after when you described was the boom and there was probably lots of 21 year olds coming through. And that's very much been, I wouldn't say my generation, maybe Dara and my generation of when we started playing, but obviously we're a bit older. Um, but like definitely all of the guys we knew who were 21, 23 coming through, they're all in their early thirties now, but it feels like in the last few years, not too much young blood has come into the game and maybe we're going to eventually another few years from now, be back where you described. What have you kind of noticed through your 20 odd years playing poker <laughs> in terms of how it's changed? It's so funny because I, I think I've been through all of the milestones. Like I, I remember the first time I ever went to the World Series and I'd, I'd been to, well, I mean, yeah, just like going back to like when I very first started playing, uh, you know, I would go to Reading, even though I lived in Tooting at the time. I, it was quicker to jump on the motorway and drive to Reading than get into the West End and Park and stuff. Um, <clears throat> and I, I used to, um, I used to play there. And like Simon Trumper was like one of the kind of big name players in the five pound rebuy tournaments. Um, and then like just a, uh, quite a few years later, I suppose he, he turned up, you know, on late night poker. Um, so yeah i kind of that was a bit funny there was a couple of people that played in those games that ended up being on tv but then i, I kind of started going to vegas in the sort of early 90s but the first time i went to the world series was 97 and um ed norton and uh ben Am ben affleck uh were getting ready to do rounders and uh, they thought they'd hang around the World Series and kind of speak to a lot of people and try and, you know, immerse themselves in the whole thing. Uh, and I played, I, for some reason, I got to play in the media tournament. Um, a friend of mine was genuinely in the media and he managed to get me into it. Um, and they played in it. And, you know, so I definitely remember pre-rounders I do remember that actually, Roland, uh, I was on a table with Roland once and Eric Seidel sat down on the table and uh, I always a bit daunted when Eric Seidel's on the table. I don't know about you two if you've played with him before, but um, he's definitely someone that I'm sort of always a bit scared I'm going to do something stupid and also just kind of keen to have a chat with him, but terrified that I can't think of anything much to say, which is unusual for me. Um, but uh, yeah, Roland said to him, were you like me? Did you, uh, did you get into poker because of rounders? Which I thought was quite a funny joke. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, 
no, I do remember that, and that was that was a thing that slightly changed it. Um, you know, there was a time in London where, um, in the sort of mid to late nineties, where the, the 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 dungeon, as they called it, was the card room in the basement of the Stackis Casino in Russell Square. And they, they had been having tournaments from the sort of mid to late 90s with 40 or 50 people every weeknight. And then they suddenly, the, the boss of the casino, or the boss of the chain suddenly said, we're not going to do poker anymore. It's not worth it. It's a dying game. Um, and they basically turned the, the card room into a slot parlor. And three weeks later, rounders came out and about two two years after that late night poker started and they had to change it back again uh, because, you know, people were demanding it. So I guess, I, you know, I was going to casinos at a time where people said it's a dead game. Nothing. Nobody wants to play it. It's just for, you know, old codgers. And, um, you know, I went. I went to casinos when people were playing Ma Yong and it was considered to be a similar thing. The Ma Yong was a thing that got a lot of the Chinese punters to come. And they sort of felt like the casino sort of felt like, well, we have to put it on, but we don't, you know, we just want to get them in the door and hopefully they go and play the casino games. And that was the same with poker. They didn't sort of see it as a thing on its own. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, I guess rounders made it quite cool. I went to the, um, I got, a, I got a letter from Late Night Poker saying, do you want to play in the first series? Uh, and I looked at it and thought, no, why would I want to do that? It's like, it's £1,500. They get to see, no, no one's paying me to go. I'm making a TV program for somebody else. They're going to see how I play. Like, that sounds awful. I can't think of any advantages. I mean, it's so stupid, really, because there were loads of advantages, actually, if you thought about it. But... Um, I just ignored it and didn't go. And then they did, I think it was the seventh series before I actually played on it. Um, but it meant that I was a bit, always felt a little bit like I, I was away from those people. You know, the, you, you, you obviously know that there's a, definitely in poker, you, you feel like there's a hierarchy and you know where you kind of fit in. And there are certain people like Eric Seidel, like if he comes to your table, you know you're below him or, on the hierarchy and some people will say well i'll only really speak to him if he speaks to me other people will kind of natter to him in an excited way because he's a big mega star in poker but you definitely every player that's being honest will will appreciate that you know they know where they are on the hierarchy and i, I definitely felt below eric Seidel, but i def definitely with the late night poker thing even though you know, when you watch it back, most of those people were useless at poker. Uh, the fact that they played on TV uh, made me think, God, they're, you know, they're like super good, really. Um, so I do, I do kind of think that was a that was a sort of a real kind of thing for me. I struggled with, and then um, I went madly. Really, I was playing sort of five hundred pound tournaments, hundred pound tournaments, late nineties. And suddenly they, this thing, the Poker Million, came up. And you could go to the Isle of Man and play for £6,000 and you could win a million. So I just said, yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah, I'll go and do that. Like, I think the biggest tournament I ever played was 500 before that. So, yeah, 500 up to 6000 I mean, I don't know what that is in today's <laughs> money. It was 1999 and that's probably 25000 20000 Um So, yeah, I went to play that. And... Um, I got on to Phil Helmuth's table and we finished the day and weirdly, you know, being Phil Helmuth, he, he was bugged about a hand where I'd bluffed him about six hours earlier and he wanted to ask me what I had in it, uh, which I lied to him about. I didn't tell him I'd bluffed him, but um, he, he said to me, what did you have? And I said, I, 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 I think I'd four bet him with eight, nine offsuit. And, uh, he said to me, he had queens and he'd folded. And I said, well, Phil, you know, there were only three possible hands that I could have to play the hand the way I played it. And, um, you know, you had queens. So I think you can pretty much work out what hand I had. And he went, yes, I thought so. I thought so. Of course he did. 
Uh, anyway, uh, I, the, 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 while I was having that conversation with him, the TV came on and the first ever episode of Late Night Poker came on the TV for the first time. And um, so I definitely remember the start of Late Night Poker. And that, to me, was the big changing point in poker because suddenly, um, you know, the games in London, I, I, you couldn't get a Hold'em game. I'd go to play Hold'em. I liked playing Hold'em and they wanted to play Omaha or seven card stud, pot limit seven card stud. Um, so that was a massive transition really in London that you, you could now go and play Hold'em four or five times a week. Whereas before that, uh, you know, you might get a game once a month or something like that. Um, so that, that was a big thing. And then, yeah, I think Moneymaker was a lesser thing at the time because that was 2003. Chris Moneymaker won the World Series and he'd won his seat on, on stars and, you know, he'd qualified uh, through a satellite. That was a huge thing in America, not least because they had a, they had a uh, ice hockey strike that year. And ESPN2 didn't have anything to show because they used to show ice hockey all the time. So they just kept repeating Chris Moneymaker's victory over and over and over. Like there was about 20 hours of TV and it must have shown it a hundred times that year. Um, but I think it didn't really kick in in the UK until a couple of years later, the whole sort of internet surge. Yeah. Although in America, it, it was very much in 2003, four. I think over here, it didn't really happen until five, six. But I... I I definitely can remember, you know, each of those stages and basically all that happened in each of them was the games just got better and better. Like, that, and it, for me personally, I, you know, I never thought I was a particularly brilliant poker player ever. I still don't think I have ever been that good at poker, but I definitely felt like I can beat this game and it's the best use of my time. And I've got to get as much money out of it as I possibly mm. can because it can't last. And the reason I thought that was always because I'd seen what it was like before with card rooms closing and slot machines coming in and whatever. And I, I, I always just thought, this is a gimmick. It's gonna not, you know, it's not gonna last. Which was weird because I, it, meant, it ended up with me, you know, like 2006, I think I played 324, 14 hour sessions. Wow. I, I just never left the house. I never left the casino, I had a, a house casino and home, I, I used to eat three meals a day in the casino, uh, never do anything else. Uh, if I went, you know, the, the other 40 days, I went to Vegas. I, I had about three days off a year. Um, so I, I, I definitely feel like, I mean, I probably got that wrong because poker's still around and people are still enjoying it and people are still winning. Uh, it's definitely got harder. I, I was also never a person who, I don't think I was ever a person that sort of went, these internet people are so stupid. Um, <clears throat> I do remember very clearly, I played with Chris Mormon quite a bit um, at the World Series. I just, you know, those things where you play a series of tournaments and the same guy always ends up on your table. Like that, that mm. and it, it, obviously it's one of those, it's like bad beats, isn't it? It's one of those tricks of the memory. You think, well, this is weird, but of course, it, you know, it could be any that's, of, well, that's true randomness, of people yeah. that happens to be on your table. But yeah. anyway, this particular year, it was always Chris Borman. I must have played 40 tournaments. He was on my starting table like seven times. Um, and um, I just watched him getting knocked out in really stupid ways. But my reaction wasn't to say these internet players are stupid. It, it was just that I didn't feel like, and I don't, I mean this to be disrespectful to Chris because I think he's a really smart player but I just felt like he was taking quite a while to get the difference between playing mm. online and coming to the World Series and playing against live players in a way he was being a bit too clever he always kind of thought that they had a three bet range that was much wider than it was mm. so he had a much wider four bet range than was going to be profitable in that situation now probably online at that time that was very reasonable but the, the live game was still quite a long way behind. Well, you know, I mean, the, you would go to the World Series and, yeah, there were plenty of people on your table that would never three bet unless they had ace, queen or better. And uh, mm -hmm. and he kept on getting knocked out, four betting those people with, uh, with, with you know, average hands. But I, de I, I, I definitely always felt like when these guys crack it, 
that's the end of it for me. I'll be ruined. I won't be able to do this anymore. Um, which was, again, was another reason why I sort of felt like I should cram it as much as possible. Picking up on something you said there, Neil, mm. uh, I'll put this to Dara, actually. We spoke about this a few weeks ago on a show with Berkey, and, and Neil sort of brought it up again, which is this notion of poker, or actually, I can't remember the Chinese game you, you said there a moment ago. Mo Young. Mo Young. Mo Young. Being the sort of way to get people in. I remember Berkey referred to it as a funnel. It was like, well, what the big bookies what the big kind of super merged betting companies are doing now is they're sort of looking at their overall client list their overall email list all the people who, who play on their site and they think well poker is like maybe three percent or four percent of your look here maybe it's one or two percent whatever it happens to be and they're thinking well it's really good to get people in because actually those same people do their money then on maybe some casino stuff some sports betting stuff and that takes the onus off creating a profit model around poker and we saw that with a, a few companies on the way up whether they would view their live component like a trojan horse and then once they got you online they'd get the money out of you or indeed this model where it's like get them in for poker i think in a way this year more than any other year pandemic as we've been all in our homes for you know 10 months feels like poker's value to these companies has grown not just because they've clearly made more money in these little booms we had during lockdown mm. but because it seems not just pandemic proof but actually better in a pandemic than well obviously when there's no sports to bet on so with that in mind Darrow, like how do you feel strategy wise the kind of the the bosses in these companies should be thinking about poker going forward should they be trying to make money off it on its own or should they be trying to maybe break even on it but use it as a, as a way to get people in the door I think the reality is that even if it were more sensible to, 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 to view it as a customer acquisition tool, that will never be the case. It's always the case with cor in corporations that once you have divisions, every division just cares about itself and its own profitability. And they want to go to the board at the end of the year and say, we made X amount and they really don't care about the other divisions. In fact, if anything, they want the other divisions to fail because they want their division to look better. Um, my uncle was a politician and he used to say that the only politician you had to be really careful about was your running mate because he was the only person who could take your job <laughs> so in theory they were on the same team in theory he was supposed to be helping him get elected but actually he was the guy that he really didn't want to get elected he he he, he wanted to remain top dog it's the same mentality in companies every division looks after itself every division wants to look good in comparison to the other divisions so the reality is poker will always want to make money and that's why the poker industry has gone along the way it was. There might have been an overall view from, you know, very forward thinking uh, poker people like Isai Scheinberg at the start that will use live poker tournaments as um, loss leaders. But very quickly, the corporate mechanism kicks in and now they have to make money. And I think it's always going to be the same for poker. It's been a very good year for poker because, as you say, it looks really good in comparison to all the other stuff now. It has proven to be pandemic proof, which the other industries haven't. Um, it's been also proven that it's possible to get people back playing online. A lot of people who haven't played online for years have come back this year and played. And the, they, they, they scrambled a bit at the start. They didn't really know what to do or how to appeal to these players. Um, a lot of them have, have done good stuff, uh, you know, party using real names, which is something live players like, party banning HUDs, another thing uh, live players like. So they've sort of thought about how to cater for live players. They've also run series, which again is, the, is very much the live model. The online model is you play the same tournaments every night and you get in enough volume uh, to make your money over the year. The live model is you aim at a few big festivals a year and uh, you try and satellite in, in, in the rest of the time. And I think the online operators have realized that that's how to appeal to those type of players. Yeah. And I think the home game market, which I know I've championed a few times now over the course of these shows has shown uh, itself to be a reasonably good acquisition tool as well, as people have been sort of sitting around, maybe a bit scared to jump into the, the regular tournaments. Maybe you do have that image of, Oh, all the sharks will come get me now. Why would I even bother? But if they can jump into what is essentially a kitchen table game with their mates. And of course on Unibet, they can do that rake free. It's actually a fairly friendly uh, way in. I'm interested by your thoughts there though, there, because you, you're obviously sort of suggesting that in the end um, internal reasons within companies will, will will ultimately make them compete against one another or at least you know have to wipe their 
wipe their feet if you like and um, they're going to have to sort of make a decent bit of money i know from conversations with kat arns me uh, kat arns me uh, both at uni but particularly in her previous job actually where she used to battle for the value of a customer who came in through poker if they did do money in the other things her kind of saying well that's my customer you see like i i got that guy in the door so it's not fair for you to kind of view oh will he play two 10 quid you know mtts every night we get two quid off him every day that's not that huge a customer frankly um whereas you know the same guy goes to the roulette machine and loses 100 quid twice a week or whatever he did and she's like well that's still that should count for me at some level she felt like that was part and parcel of her customer acquisition and what she had contributed and and, and getting the the sites to measure that appropriately was actually a big part of her previous job and i don't know within unibet she may believe that she's on a similar mission i don't know i know that's something she cares about any uh, views on this one neil before we move on well there's a couple of things first of all i think you're right i, I was talking to somebody at sky and they were saying uh you know, not only have they had a really good year which i'm sure all poker companies have but yeah, you know, they were sort of saying oh, it's like the best year for seven years uh which i, I thought was you know yeah, it seemed reasonable. I would have, I might have even guessed longer ago than that. I mean, it, but it, you know, it's interesting to think about when you think the sort of poker boom time kind of started to slip away a little bit, and maybe maybe 2013 is a good guess at that. But also, they were saying, oh, yeah, lots of older signups, uh, and that you know, maybe quite a lot of people that have sort of, uh, you know, maybe said, oh, I'm not too sure about this online. I don't enjoy it so much. I bumped into a guy in the street the other day, actually. Um, I was obviously doing some essential shopping. Um, and uh, he's he's an old Vic regular, you know, and he's in his 70s and uh, lives around the corner. And um, I haven't seen him for ages, actually. And he said to me, yeah, I don't really like this online poker, but I've been playing you know, because he misses going into the Vic. And like, yeah. you know, what else is he going to do? You know, and I think a lot of people have sort of bitten the bullet. That, that wouldn't necessarily do it before. The other thing I've, I was thinking while you were talking was about Jack Binion because, um, you know, back in the early days of the World Series, uh, he was very visionary and that he always sort of said, well, you know, you give the poker players, you know, a really good quality buffet that's free if they play in the tournament, the main, you know, there was only one World Series event each day uh, and they'd all stop for dinner and have this buffet and it, it, he'd really throw money at that and make it decent. And he'd give people money off their room and everything like that. Because he appreciated that if you get them into your casino and fill it up, they're, they're going to do their money, you know, some other way. Uh, maybe they'll play blackjack or roulette if they go on tilt from the poker. Um, and I think you're right. I think casinos don't really think that way anymore. And Vegas, is, Vegas generally has changed away from that, hasn't it? You know, it used to be that Vegas was... A really good value place to go on holiday if you didn't gamble at all because you know a lot of the food was subsidized there was a lot of happy hour drinking and you know there were loads of things that were free entertainment they've kind of taken away from that because every department has to be um individually mm. making money and yeah, I you even pay for parking now which was never a thing yeah yeah absolutely I, I, I think i definitely agree with you about the you know i've seen that uh, with a couple of companies where I've suggested with Sky, you know, originally when I first started with them, I sort of suggested to them, uh, you know, you could sort of do a, a, some kind of tournament based around the scores on the football on a Saturday. And, you, you know, that could be a good cross selling opportunity with football betting. Uh, and they were just like, yeah, we don't want to lose our poker people to football. And the football people were like, yeah, whatever, we're not really interested in promoting poker. Uh, and yeah, everyone wants to, because everyone's looking after their job, aren't they? At the end of yeah. the day, yeah. yeah. Well, guys, it has been a long year, it's been a sort of a weird year. Darren and I do get the opportunity to sort of talk about our experiences of this year, mostly being at home. Obviously, neither one of us has traveled. Uh, I, I did leave the island to go to Gozo once uh, here in Malta, <laughs> but I've pretty much just you know stayed put. I probably haven't left a, a two mile radius. Dara, you run circles around the park, so it's not even like when you do a 25 mile, 30 mile run, you're running 30 miles away. So you're, you're, you're staying pretty put as well. But when you look back on this year now, there was something you said a few shows ago where you were like, well, there's a balance point. Like initially when we were locked down, you thought, well, I 
this will be fine for me. And I know in the early days, you didn't really notice a difference because online is what you probably prefer to do over, over the two forms of poker. But you have said to me recently in the last maybe month or two more and more, oh, I am missing a little sprinkle of that for the, for the social reasons, if for no other. Can you expound on that? Yeah, it is purely for the social reasons. Um, like there, there was definitely a point where I was traveling far too much and I sort of had it in my head. I just want to knock this all on the head. Um, I'm going to quit live poker and just become an online poker player, which is essentially what I was for the first year or two, largely of my career. After that, life started to become bigger. Um, I, what I have kind of realized is that the the um, the novelty of being at home and being able to play online every day wore off fairly quickly. And I started thinking, well, I, I mean, I think we, we spoke about this years ago and I think we decided that sort of the ideal is maybe one trip a month or one trip every six weeks and um, mm. just gets you out of the house, breaks up the monotony. I, I was talking to Jack Hardcastle about this recently too. And I mean, Jack's a young lad and he's primarily an online player, but he, he, he said that he's actually struggling for motivation to play online now because he used to use the live trips as motivation. Well, I've got a live trip coming up, so I'll go hard online and then I'll have my live break and I'll come back. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll go again. Now every day is just kind of the same. So he 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 doesn't feel the same impetus, and there's this sort of um, aimlessness, I guess, of the current situation that we're that, that we find ourselves in. Yeah. So I'm definitely looking forward to live poker coming back. I I'm not that optimistic it's going to be anytime soon. I mean, Dr. Fauci said probably next winter is when we can look to things going back to reasonably well to normal. So I think maybe a year from now. Um, sort of slip back into my old life I hope but um, until then yeah I'm just gonna have to make the best of it I guess. Yeah without doing any leaky lap and stuff uh, you know we've made no formal uh, or at least at the time of recording we've made no formal decision at uni about what we're going to do about live last year obviously we were the first to decide to cancel sorry I shouldn't use the word cancel because we didn't cancel it we moved it all online to the digital platform that's the appropriate thing to say um, <laughs> no cancel events at uni but we, we moved them across to our very uh, nobody cancels events people. True. That's that. In fact, the WSOP not only did they not cancel, but they uh, they, 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 they doubled, doubled it. <laughs> exactly. So uh, we haven't made a, as I said at the time of recording, a, a formal decision on next year. But I know from just chats internally, it's definitely the second half of the year that they're looking more positively at. They're not looking particularly positively at all at the first half of the year, which I think is right. And exactly what you said, Dara. You know, it's it's not like vaccine cavalry's coming are going to really manifest until the spring at best and and, and even then it's it's not as clear cut or as simple um as some might think so look I, interesting i have to say i i share your view i i am going for a live event uh, and and it is mostly to do with social i think i'm probably quite extrovert overall and i and i probably from little times during this year i found it tougher sometimes it's okay but it is. It isn't easy to sort of uh, feel like the, the the walls are are coming in, and there isn't that much novelty or newness in your life. Neil, how are you finding it? Is it is it is it okay? I mean, my gambling career has transitioned so many times. You know, I mean, when I originally started, it was going to the horse races every single day. Uh, so I, I guess I've I, you know in that I've already done. I, I mean, I haven't been horse racing to a course since. I don't know, 2005, I think, maybe. Uh, So I kind of essentially went from being a kind of live player on horses to an online player. Um, So doing that for poker shouldn't really be that difficult. I I kind of think of myself, I don't really call myself a poker player these days. I mean, I'm somebody that gambles every day and some of that gambling is poker. Um, I've probably played more online this year uh in a more disciplined way like i've sort of said right i'm gonna play you know tuesday friday and sunday this week and i've stuck to that and i've made sure i do it whereas like in past years i'd be like yeah i'll just play the nights that i fancy it and it kind of depends whether i've been winning on the horses if i've been winning a lot on the horses then it feels a bit pointless playing online in the evening. And if I've been doing my absolute nuts on the horses, it equally feels a bit pointless. <laughs> so I only play on the days where I've been kind of having a break even day. And I feel like I want to at least win or Band lose. Band of outcomes. 
yeah, yeah exactly. that, that, that reminds me of my first big friend in poker rob taylor uh rob, rob had this mentality his, his monday was really important because if he won big on a monday he'd say okay well i can take the week off now i've made enough money for the week and if he <laughs> lost big he would say oh i have to take the rest of the week off to clear my head so basically <laughs> he only played on tuesdays when he was kind of break even <laughs> i can't remember the guy's name now he, he's a he's an irish guy that you'll know but there was a guy that used to come in the game sometime he used to come over to london and play sometimes and he revealed once um he showed us his book with his his session results written down and somebody said well it's just not credible like you it it looks like you never lose and he said no i only I, only, I don't put the big losing ones in the book uh, because it just demoralizes you and it's no, it doesn't help you in the long run. <laughs> Good for him. Um, well, final question, no, please. I, 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 I mean, it obviously has not been totally easy, but I think as you, you, you're a young man, you know, um, I, I think as for you me? get older, yeah, <laughs> as, as you get older, like the, the, the prospect of, uh, you know, the worst thing anyone could do is invite you to a social event on a Friday night. Like, <laughs> you know, you, you, when, when you're younger, like having nothing to do on a Friday night is an absolute disaster. When you're older, it's the best thing ever. Uh, you could just like, you know, oh, great. I can catch up on that series I've been watching or, you know, have a nice bit of takeaway and some wine or get into you know, the bar. Or play online poker. <laughs> And it's, it's perfect get those scented, that, get those scented candles out that I bought off your man <laughs> exactly exactly yeah help the help the, help the poker economy um no I don't I, don't, I mean I, I have a, I can't say I've been doing any you know dire long distance running but I have I have made the effort to do a few steps every day I've been getting getting my walking up a bit you know that's about as good as I can do I do if I try and do like 12,000 a day that's that's not a bad start really but I've, I've done all the cliched stuff of putting on weight and drinking too much during lockdown definitely yeah yeah well I, I, I'm on my uh, hot rum for uh, or not hot rum sorry hot port for Christmas so uh, well, that's Christmas you're just doing I'm a doing Christmas that, yeah. thing. <laughs> well okay final question it has to be quick because mm. I'm very conscious of your time Neil oh okay uh, new year's resolutions you go first Oh Jesus! I hadn't even thought of that. I I, I I I hardly ever make them. I used to make gambling ones, and they were always things like, you know, do less multiple bets and more singles and stuff. When I was like first <laughs> in gambling, because you know multiple bets were considered to be muggy. But if you if you if you're having a plus EV bet, multiple bets are brilliant. You should do more of them. Um, I, I don't know. I I, I definitely. I tell you, I did something this year. The transition between the flat season and the jump season was the worst time to bet on the horses ever. And I know that every single year, but there's this cusp period in sort of late September, early October. And I can never resist it, even though I know that my figures over the years tell me that it's just a no-no. Uh, and I should just bet much smaller or not at all in that time. And I actually did it this year. So maybe I should make it make it and I, I would have done my nuts as well so maybe i should uh, make a resolution to do that for next year and to stick to it every year and you were going to get a quintessentially niche answer there dara you have a go now yeah my, my answer is pretty niche too my uh my new year's resolutions are always based around uh, online poker and they're always pretty much the same uh be more disciplined in the games that i register uh, don't register too many games. My my um, my performance drops off fairly rapidly once I go above twelve tables, and yet almost every session I go above twelve tables at some have point. You, have you ever like got proper figures on that? Like where like the time at which you register, or you know, if you play tournament, if you only played the tournaments early in your session and never the late registered tournaments, not not where you register late. For the tournament i don't mean like where you wait until it's been running an hour before you register i mean the ones where i don't know you don't you start at 11 p.m or whatever uh if you knock those on the head would you be better have you measured it like that i've never actually measured because i mean obviously the variance is such that you you know you could just run well in a, in a couple of early tournaments but i do i like i do know that there's a sort of a sweet spot around eight tables where i'm very very conscious of every single thing that's happening on every table um i go above that i i I play a little, I just play a bit more automatically, but I go above 12 tables and then I actually start to time out or misclick. And, uh, 
uh, you know, whether whether it works out or not. Like sometimes a mislick works out. Like yesterday I timed out with Kings uh, and I would have run into aces. So <laughs> I can't really go, I, I can't really judge off results. If I'd been playing better, I would have bust that tournament um, instead of coming fifth. Uh, so, um, but yeah, I, I judge it basically just on sort of stuff like how how I know I'm playing, how much information I'm taking in, and that definitely does degrade uh, as I add more tables. It used to be a lot easier because uh, when when all the sites allowed HUDs, um, I just worked off the HUD stats and I could just 16 and 20 tables fairly comfortably. Now more and more the sites don't allow HUDs, so I have to uh, actually pay attention, and that's that's basically the point where uh, <laughs> that's what's have, doomed you having to actually concentrate. Yeah, on absolutely. Life. Like people used to ask me about hands, and they'd say, "Oh, this hand," and you know, I, I could even play a hand against David online, and I wouldn't realize that it was David because I'm not looking at that part of the screen, which I'm shows the screen name of numbers. or even the avatar. I am literally just looking at the numbers on the HUD, going, "Oh, this this guy's a real calling station," so I'm not going to block him. <laughs> he was kids. there with his Christmas hat, and you can see that. <laughs> yeah. there he is. This guy's playing like a drunk. Look at those. Look, he's got a V-pip of 74. He's had a half a bottle of port, I think, at this stage. Okay, guys, listen, thank you so, so much. We're going to wrap it up there. I have to say a huge thank you, uh, Neil. Or would, I'm kind of sad now thinking that, you know, maybe in the parallel universe, we'd be colleagues right now. But uh, it is always wonderful to have you on your... A, uh, a great there's still uh, time for the there's still time for you guys to cross over come and Maybe. come and join the flutter <laughs> empire that's it well you are an ambassador of the game and a great raconteur for that we thank you so much neil channing and darrow carney who's probably playing poker now it sounds like poor tabling <laughs> already <yeah. laughs> thanks guys cheers thanks <laughs>